We're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is a statement by Shirley Ann Somerville on delivery of devolved benefits. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Shirley Ann Somerville. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last year was a momentous one for Scottish Social Security, and we started to build a new public service for Scotland. The Social Security Scotland Act passed into law last June. Three months later, our country's new agency, Social Security Scotland, opened its doors. And since then, we've put over £35 million of additional funding into the pockets of people in Scotland, delivering the first two payments of the Carers' Allowance Supplement and the Best Start Grant Pregnancy and Baby Payment. This year, we'll introduce four new benefits to help young carers and low-income families, and we are also consulting on our new job grant for young people moving into employment. We've made a strong start, and today I will set out our plans beyond 2019. We have already taken responsibility for carers' benefits, our carers' allowance and carers' allowance supplement, together are an investment of £320 million in 2019-20 alone. On the 1st of April next year, we will take full responsibility for the remaining devolved benefits, which means benefits will start to be fully funded by the Scottish Government. From that point, Social Security Scotland will progressively take over administrating these benefits from the Department of Work and Pensions. For the first time, the Scottish Government will make regular Social Security payments week in, week out, direct to people's bank accounts, payments that Scottish families will budget into their weekly shop or monthly heating bill. The complicated nature and inter inter interdependencies of both social security and of devolution means this is no mean feat. Two governments, two agencies will share clients. The payments people get from the DWP and Social Security Scotland will affect and in some cases need to interact with one another. This is not a lift and shift approach where we take over the whole of social security and start changes from the inside out. Whilst that would have, of course, been my preference, and it would arguably have been a simpler process. But what we are starting from scratch, effectively needing to untie one set of benefits from a labyrinthine DWP system, build our own system to allow for the transfer, and then make sure the systems work together seamlessly. It is imperative that we get this right, so people not only get the right money at the right time, but are still eligible for other assistance that they can be passported to as well. This is a formidable responsibility which I do not underestimate and it is also a great opportunity to forge a social security system infused with dignity, fairness and respect. What is clear to me, what we have heard repeatedly from people with direct personal experience of the current system, is that we must ensure that people entitled to these benefits are protected during the transition. Yes, protected from aspects of the current DWP regime, but protected too from the errors that inevitably follow when politicians rush through big changes in social security. We do not have to look far. The debacle of the DWP's migration of people from incapacity benefit to ESA, the DLA to PIP migration due to finish in 2015, then 2019, now delayed until 2021, and above all the universal credit programme due for completion by 2017, now it's 2023, six years later than planned, and yet still fundamentally flawed. Presiding officer, we all need to learn lessons of these failures, and it's clear to me that changes to social security need to be implemented with painstaking care, always at pace, but never rushed, or we run the risk that people fall through the gaps. Take the time to get this right, is the message I'm hearing. Last month, we conducted an experience panel survey about people's priority as our agency takes over cases from the DWP. Of over 400 respondents, 57% said they wanted the Scottish Government to strike a balance between transferring cases quickly and making sure there are no mistakes. A further 29% would rather we, still, we took still more time to avoid errors. Presiding officer, since my appointment, I've been listening. I'm well aware how high the stakes are and I will not take risks that endanger people's payments. We have seen that it is those who rely on the payments the most who then pay the price. Over the past eight months, I've been talking to people with lived experience and challenging my officials on what can be achieved, balancing pace and risk with clear principles in mind. 
protecting people and their entitlements, acting quickly to reform aspects of the current system which cause most stress, and ensuring that we put into place a dignified, respectful system that works for Scotland. After careful consideration, I have determined on a timetable taking over the remaining benefits which, based on current plans, I believe whilst challenging, is realistic. Presiding officer, as I have said, from April 2020, we will become responsible for the remaining devolved benefits and I am delighted to say, starting next summer, the first disability benefit to open to new claims will be disability assistance for children and young people. We will also deliver on our manifesto commitment to extend eligibility for this benefit from age 16 to 18. This will allow continuity for families during those crucial transition years when a child becomes an adult. Also from next year, children who receive the highest care component of disability assistance will be entitled to winter heating assistance too, meaning 16,000 children and their families will get a £200 lump sum to help towards their heating costs. Keeping up the pace early in 2021, I'm pleased to say that we'll introduce an additional payment for the estimated 1,800 Scottish carers who look after more than one disabled child, recognising the higher costs they face. By the end of 2021, we'll also start paying winter heating assistance in its current form to eligible older people in Scotland who receive another type of payment from our agency. We'll also make the first cold spell heating assistance payments too. Turning to new claims for disability assistance for older people, those over state pension age who need someone to help them because of a disability. And I can announce that this will be introduced by the end of next year. Building on this progress in early 2021, we'll introduce the largest, the most complex form of disability assistance, the new claim service for working age people replacing DWP's PIP. I remain committed to co-designing these benefits with the people of Scotland. A person-centred approach will be at the heart of Scotland's three forms of disability assistance. Through major reforms of the assessment process, we will significantly reduce face-to-face -face assessments. Where assessments are needed, we will deliver them through our own agency, not through the private sector, and people will be invited to attend assessments at a time and place that suits them, with the assessor coming to them if required. By the end of 2021, we will also deliver new claims for Scottish Carers Allowance, folding together that benefit Carers allowance supplement and additional money for carers of more than one disabled child in a way that meets carers' needs. Presiding officer, I've carefully considered whether Scottish carers' allowance could be delivered more quickly, and I know carers are rightly keen for us to take it over as soon as possible. But I've concluded that carers' allowance, above all, is a benefit which we have to take the time to get right. It interacts in a particularly intricate way with functions that remain reserved. It affects income tax, for example, meaning that we will need new data sharing arrangements with HMRC to administer it effectively. It is also a gateway to other benefits, which are in the gift of the UK government, such as the carer premium, worth around £36 a week on top of someone's means-tested benefit. The last thing I want to do is to jeopardise these additional payments by rushing delivery of carer's allowance before the necessary agreements with the UK government are in place. Nor do I want to encourage the growth of a two-tier system between new and existing claims. By introducing new claims in 2021, we can ensure that we protect payments for carers who rely on them. It will also allow us to focus on getting all three forms of disability assistance right to support the people cared for by our carers. This is particularly important given the scale of change we are proposing to the application process, the desk-based decision-making and face-to-face -face assessments. I am therefore pleased to say that by the end of 2021, we will be delivering new claims for all disability and carers' assistance and supporting families with their winter fuel bills. I now turn to the task of moving people's existing claims from the DWP to Social Security Scotland. I mentioned before the importance of ensuring we protect people's benefits as they transfer. This is as true for existing benefits as it is for new claims. We must move people to our agency in a way that causes them minimal anxiety while safeguarding the payments they're currently getting. Feedback from our experience panels shows how we can achieve both. I mentioned earlier a survey we conducted last month with people experienced in the current system to ask what's most important to them as we take on their cases. Their top two priorities were that people should continue to receive the correct payments at the right time and that no one should be subject to a DWP face-to-face -face reassessment for disability benefits. 
will use this research as the basis for a set of client-centred transfer principles agreed with user and stakeholder input. So let me be clear today, we will protect people's payments during transfer. From early 2021, when we launch new claims for our PIP replacement, I can guarantee that no one in Scotland will undergo a DWP face-to-face -face assessment for disability benefits. Before someone reaches the end of their DWP award period, we will take over their case so this cannot happen. I can also guarantee that unlike for universal credit, we will not require people to make a new claim to move on to the Scottish benefits. Instead, we will work with the DWP to arrange the transfer to happen automatically. We will keep people informed of what will happen and when, before and during the process. Presiding officer, we will start the work of transferring people from the DWP to our agency next year. This involves moving more than half a million cases, 10% of people in Scotland. Such transfers have in the past caused huge problems when the DWP have migrated within its own benefits system. What hasn't been done before is transferring people from one government's agency to another's. And we must do this effectively and securely and in conjunction with the DWP. With their cooperation, I expect the majority of people to be transferred by 2023 with all cases fully transferred by 2024. Now, what I hadn't anticipated during this work was the further delay to the D D DWP's daily to PIP migration, which means that people of working age will still be on two benefits at the point when we expect to transfer them to a single form of Scottish assistance. My officials are in close contact with DWP officials on this matter, and I have also requested a meeting with DWP ministers to discuss the implications. I will, of course, report back to Parliament once discussions are more advanced. Going forward, we will work with the DWP to develop agency agreements to partially administer the devolving benefits until Social Security Scotland is delivering them in full. These will ensure people receive the regular payments they've already been awarded with minimal disruption and distress. This is an administrative function only. It does not affect when we commence powers or start funding benefits. As I've said, from April 2020, benefits will be fully funded by the Scottish Government. <clears throat> Presiding officer, delivering the devolved benefits is very much a joint enterprise with the DWP, and we rely on them to match our ambition and pace. The timescales I've set out remaining, uh, the timescales I've set out remain very challenging, and there are many unknowns, both within our work on social security devolution and beyond. We will therefore keep our plans under careful review, and I will keep Parliament updated on our progress. Presiding officer, we shouldn't forget that we are the first government to begin the partial separation of a highly integrated welfare system between two countries. This cannot be done without taking difficult decisions on timing. But every day as we break new ground, we gain more experience of how to accomplish the most complicated feat of devolution attempted since this parliament was reconvened. A great deal of activity is already well underway to make our current plans a reality. Today, I will publish 11 policy papers setting out the extensive work that's gone into designing how these benefits will operate. Next week, I'll also publish a consultation on disability assistance to seek the views of the public on our proposed reforms, including introducing rolling rewards with up to 10 years between reviews for people whose condition is unlikely to change, and how we will ensure the people who undertake our assessments for disability assistance are suitably qualified. In parallel, we'll pursue our ambitious timetable for 2019. By the end of this year, just 18 months from Scotland's Social Security Act, we'll have delivered three of the 11 devolved benefits and four brand new payments. And two years hence, Social Security Scotland will have made over £210 million in benefit payments, agency staff will have supported 200,000 people, and we will have brought a new culture of dignity, fairness and respect to Scottish Social Security. Certainly, we have our work cut out as we deliver devolved benefits to the people of Scotland, but the prize is great. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Minister will now take questions. Start with Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Mark Griffin. Michelle Ballantyne. Right. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. And I absolutely agree that the transition must be handled properly. This is about making sure that the people get the support they need. They are the priority in all of this. But the Cabinet Secretary must see the utter hypocrisy this statement exposes. For two years, you have slammed the DWP. You have used highly charged language on the UK government's administration of benefits. 
You have raised expectations and promised the earth to some of Scotland's most vulnerable people. And after repeated promises that the new system would be up and running by the end of this parliament, we now learn that it will be 2024 before Pip's successor is in place. And this is from the party that said it could set up an independent country in 18 months. It will have taken nine years to introduce the devolution of 11 social security benefits. Can the minister not see that this is deeply embarrassing? Next April, she takes over executive competence. So my question to you is, will you now apologise to the hard-working Scottish DWP staff she has repeatedly denigrated and whom she is now asking to keep running benefits for another five years on her behalf? Thank you. Colin Cabinet Secretary. Well, let's be absolutely clear. I will make no apologies for criticising the DWP for the way that they tackle universal credit and other aspects of this. And it is never, it is never the staff who are responsible for the policies of their political masters. And it is the staff who have to bear the brunt, unfortunately, on the front line of the policies of the Tory government. Now, the, the successor to PIP will be in place in 2021. And it's very, very important to recognise that this is the area where most people have had criticism of the DWP system as it is at present. And that's why we are making substantial changes to the assessment process, to the application process and to the desk-based process. And if you can think that that is not a good thing to do, if you think we should just lift the DWP system and transfer it over, then what a missed opportunity for the Scottish system in here. And it is absolutely not the case that this can be compared to what can come up with independence because, as I said during my statement, this is a partial attempt to prize out 15% of benefits from the system rather than a lift and shift of it. The fact that this is actually around partial devolution is indeed part of the intricacies of this programme. And I'm sure actually Michelle Ballantyne would have been more aware of some of the difficulty of that had she been able to attend the, 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 um, the, the programme development opportunity that she had within Victoria Key to talk through exactly some of the challenges that we have when we're developing the system and she could come to it with that process. So it is very, very disappointing that and rather than seeing the opportunities that we have as we deliver a substantially improved service within Social Security Scotland, that Michelle Ballantyne somehow still thinks that the DWP are doing a good job under the Conservative government. And that's exactly why we will have a very different policy up here and a very different experience for everyone that's experiencing Social Security within our agency. Thank you. Just, can I just encourage everyone to keep their remarks uh, respectful and through the chair. No, don't use the term you. Mark Griffin. President officer, I'm disappointed, like disgusted even, at some of the details that have been brought to the chamber. Labour have long called for details of the timeline for delivery of social security systems built on dignity and respect. And now we know why we've been so, told so little. Yet again, the sick, disabled, Older people and carers will have to wait to see a fairer social security system. Yeah. This morning, the Cabinet Secretary said it was a choice. A choice to use CPI. A choice to use agency agreements yeah. and to see carers being forced to cut their working hours. And today, the Cabinet Secretary wants to force those same choices on Scotland's disabled communities. <laughs> no doubt paying millions to the DWP for the privilege. It also makes a mockery of the SNP promises in 2014 that a separate Scottish state could be set up in 18 months, 18 months. when vulnerable, 18 people, months. vulnerable people <laughs> will have been waiting a decade for the full devolution yeah. of social security yeah. powers. Yeah. Now, I'm not asking the Cabinet Secretary to apologise to DWP staff. I want the Cabinet Secretary today to apologise to every single disabled person she is leaving at the hands of the Tories yep. for another five years. Cabinet Secretary. 
As I set out in my statement, we have published today 11 policy position papers which absolutely determine the work that's been going on to get to the decisions that I've taken today. And I would say to Mark Griffin as well, who also did not attend the information session with Social Security Directorate staff either, had he been through that, he would have seen some of the decision-making alternatives that we've been looking at. And genuinely, as a genuine offer to the Labour Party as we go through this process, if you have alternatives, if you absolutely have alternatives, then I'm all ears. Today, I will be sending out an invitation to all the spokespeople from all the political parties to go through in further detail than we can ever do so in the Chamber today to discuss this in much more detail. If you have alternatives, then bring them forward, but make it realistic. Don't pretend to people that you have an alternative, because at this point, you've never, the, the Labour Party have never demonstrated that they can deliver a safe and secure transition and deliver what people want, which is, is to ensure that they get the right payments at the right time. That's what this, uh, the timetable is doing that I have announced today. And if the Labour Party have a credible, a realistic alternative, then I'm all ears to be able to look through it. But I fear, just like the budget, they will be all talk and no delivery, because that is exactly like the Labour Party Act in opposition. Thank you very much. Quite lengthy opening exchanges. Can we keep the rest of the questions and answers quite succinct? Ruth McGuire to be followed by Alison Johnson. Ruth McGuire. Presiding officer, given the UN Special Rapporteur on Poverty and Human Rights described the UK Government's approach to welfare as punitive, mean-spirited and often callous, does the Cabinet Secretary think it's important to reassure people by reiterating our ambition to do things differently here in Scotland and build a social security system based on dignity and respect that works for people and not against them? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I do. It is, believe it is imperative that people are able to put trust back in a system as we build our new social security system. And it works for people rather than against them. We'll do this by ensuring we get decisions right the first time. A redesigned application process will be accessible and clear. And because we've recognised it can be difficult for clients to gather relevant evidence, Social Security Scotland will help with this. We will use the supporting evidence to make more award decisions without the need for face-to-face -face assessments. And where they are required, we've outlined our commitments, as I set out in my statement, that will be undertaken by assessors that are suitably qualified and at a time and location that suits clients. All awards will be rolling with no set endpoints and reviews will be set at dates that take account of clients' conditions. And we'll ensure that people with fluctuating health conditions do not face additional reassessments because of regular changes they experience as a result of their condition. Alison Johnson to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you. In her response to Ruth Maguire, the Cabinet Secretary has highlighted the fact that no face to face assessments for disability assistance will be carried out for children, young people, and older people. And for other applicants, all efforts will be made to use existing evidence. Um, this comes from a Green Amendment to the Social Security Bill, supported by all parties in this chamber that I'm really proud of. But can I ask the extent of the Cabinet Secretary's ambition in this regard? Is she aiming, for example, that the great majority of working age applicants will not have to go through a face-to-face -face assessment? Cabinet Secretary. Well, that's our determination to get the, the level of face-to-face assessments down to the minimum possible level and what um, the, the chamber will see when the disability um, um, a consultation is launched next week is that we have asked the expert advisory group for a great deal of advice on this particular issue to see how we can get the application stage right, how we can get the uh, decision uh, the desk-based decisions correct so that the face-to-face -face assessments aren't required. I went back and asked for more advice and guidance on this issue because I want to make sure that we do everything at those initial stages that we can possibly do to ensure the face-to-face -face assessments are not required. And we see these as only being required if there has been no other way 
for the agency to, um, to gather the evidence it requires. And of course, it is the responsibility of the agency to gather that evidence and not on the individual. But as, as I said in my response to, to Mark Griffin, um, the, the letters will go out to all the spokespeople from all the political parties. Um, and I'm absolutely determined to ensure we can do whatever we can to minimise face-to-face assessments. I'm more than happy um, to consider that in much further detail with Alison Johnston um, when she sees the full consultation next week. Alex Cole hamilton to be followed by Claire Adams. Thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary and I have often shared common ground in our opposition to what was called the DLA takeaway, where DLA payments to children and their families were removed after protracted hospital stays of 87 days or more. Given that the Cabinet Secretary has announced that uh, the new uh, system of benefits to children with disabilities will open for claimants in 2020, can she confirm that there will be no such impediment to Scottish children who have to go into Scotland uh, into hospital for protracted periods of time? Cabinet Secretary. Well, this is one of the areas which the consultation which will be launched next week uh, can and look at and uh, determine. Uh, what we need to ensure is that when we're looking at all the three disability um, um, assessments, uh, sorry, um, disability payments that are coming forward, that we look very carefully at uh, the priorities that people are looking for us to change. Now, that might mean that we can't do everything that everybody wants um, at the first time of asking, because uh, that may have implications for how long it will take to actually deliver and build the system. Uh, but what I'm looking for during this process is a genuine and open, frank discussion about what are people's priorities and what are the implications for the programme, if any, if we implement those priorities um, as well. And I know this is um, an area where Alec Cole Hamilton has a very, very keen um, interest. And those are the type of discussions that we can get into over the consultation process about what are people's priorities and what are the implications if we're looking at that for our programme as we move ahead. Claire Adamson to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, cabinets, uh, Cabinet Secretary, in yesterday's debate, there was much discussion on the welcome increase in financial support to carers. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the decisions taken so far support carers and show what can be achieved when a dignity and respect approach is taken to Social Security? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have prioritised support for carers in our new social security system. Indeed, our first change following, following the Social Security Act coming into force was, of course, to increase the financial support to carers. Through Carers Allowance Supplement, we've improved the incomes of over 77,000 Scottish carers by £442, bringing it into line with Job Seekers Allowance. This is an increase of 13% and an investment in carers of over £33 million this financial year. As we've committed to, we'll increase the supplement annually in line with inflation. And in 2019, carers will receive an extra £452.40 compared with counterparts in the rest of the UK. With our full funding of carers' allowance and the supplement in 2019-20, investment in carers is at £320 million. We will also introduce an additional payment for carers who look after more than one disabled child, which will benefit around 1,800 Scottish carers from early 2021. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Jenny Gilbreth. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, I have to say the message we got on Tuesday lunchtime was very different than we're hearing today. And I'm sure she will be uh, speaking to her colleagues, Alistair Allen, Keith Ryan, and Sean of Obson for not being at that such vital, important meeting. Can I take the Cabinet Secretary on to a really important issue and just remind the Chamber that I am in receipt of PIP? For those of us who already received PIP, when we transfer across in 2021, or some other time after that? Will it be done under the present DWP regulations or will it be done under the new Scottish regulations? And if it is done under the new Scottish regulations, will that not require a fresh filling out of forms to assess whether the benefit is of the right value or not? Cabinet um, Secretary. The, the area around the transfer, um, particularly of um, people who have moved from DLA to PIP, is something which um, I'm sure Jelly Balfour would recognise um, I've given a, a lot of consideration to because they have had some very difficult and distressing experiences um, in the past. What we've ensured and committed to again today is that if you transfer, when you transfer over to the Scottish agency, uh, you will not have to reapply and you will not have to be reassessed. 
Now, that's a very, very important assurance that we're not putting um, additional barriers um, in front of people uh, as we move forward to the, the transfer of their cases. Now, if um, an individual, of course, requests a reassessment because their change is a fluctuating condition or their um, condition has uh, deteriorated, then, of course, that would be looked at very differently. But if it's a, a simple case of um, someone who's looking, uh, who's having to require to transfer over to the, the agency, there will be no requirement to fill in new forms and no requirement to be reassessed during that process. And I hope that that provides some reassurance to Jeremy Balfour on that issue. Can I call Jane Gilruth to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I see the horrendous problems caused by Universal Credit and the transfer to PIP in my casework every day. Is there anything the Scottish Government can do to support people in receipt of benefits from any further upheaval? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I have um, outlined in part to, to Jeremy Balfour there, we will do things very differently um, from recent DWP migration. So our case transfers will be based on the needs of people with lived experience of the current system. And we've sought uh, their initial thoughts on this. And once we have um, launched our consultation, members will be able to see that we will develop a transfer uh, principles that underpin our, our, our transfer requirements. But as I've guaranteed again today, when people's cases transfer, um, their payments will be protected. They'll get the right money at the right time. And that's very, very important reassurance for people um, to have, as well as the fact that they will not be subject to a face-to-face -face assessment. And the other aspect about not um, forcing people to reapply is very, very important, as we are learning the lessons of what has been proposed within Universal Credit, um, which uh, many stakeholders um, say will cause uh, people to fall through the gaps during that migration process. Our transfer process will be very different to that. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Stuart McMillan. This morning, Cabinet Secretary said that it was a choice that carers could be at risk of going over the carers' allowance cliff edge if they earn more than the threshold. But this afternoon, the Cabinet Secretary is telling the Chamber that she will maintain this choice for years to come. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what to say to Scotland's 80,000 unpaid carers as to what they should say to their bosses when they have to ask for fewer hours or completely lose their entitlement to this supplement. How will she make up for the lost income because of the choice to extend the full transfer of powers for Social Security by three years to 2023? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what happened this morning was that the Labour Party voted against an increase to carers' allowance. That's what happened in the... That's absolutely what happened in the, the committee this morning, and that is a deep disappointment that they did so. We did discuss in committee the fact that there is an agency agreement to allow the Scottish Government to very, very quickly deliver the carers' allowance supplement. And I said this morning uh, to committee members, and I'll say again, if we didn't do that agency agreement, we would not have been delivering the carers' allowance supplement. So just as the Scottish Government has made choices, then I think to be a responsible opposition, that also the opposition parties need to responsibly look at, if you didn't want the agency agreement, then be frank to people that they wouldn't have had their carers' allowance supplement, because that is the reality of what you're saying. And if you're looking to change agency agreements, be frank to people about the implications of doing that as well. And that's why I've made very clear in my response to Mark Griffin, if you've got realistic proposals that want to come forward, my door is always open, but I doubt that will happen. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Graham Simpson. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding officer. Uh, officer. How can the Cabinet Secretary guarantee that the Scottish social security system will treat people with, with disabilities differently and challenge the stigma around benefits associated with the UK government's system? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it's absolutely um, important that we do challenge the stigma around benefits uh, that people um, unfortunately face um, at the moment. And that came out very loud and clear as we developed uh, the charter and as uh, it was within that charter. That's why I'm determined to ensure that uh, disabled people in Scotland get access to the benefits that they're entitled to in a way that supports their needs and treats them with the dignity and respect they deserve. So we'll ensure that we've got a person-centred service with dignity and respect embedded of that framework of disability assessments. 
And I suppose to concentrate on a, a concrete example um, on this, as well as what I've already outlined in relation to assessments, I have very serious concerns, for example, about the 50 metre rule in relation to disability assessments and the negative impact that has had. And I want to find a better way to understand people's mobility needs and ensure that people get the best benefits that they are entitled to. So we want to get that right and we'll be working with stakeholders and clients in the consultation to find a different and better descriptor on that issue. Uh, Graeme Simpson, to be followed by Bob Doris. Graeme Simpson. The, the Cabinet Secretary says she expects the majority of people to be transferred by 2023 uh, with, and expects all cases to be fully transferred by 2024, which is not a guarantee of anything. Um, having um, said that all these benefits would be uh, originally transferred before May 2021, that's now been uh, kicked down the road. Can she tell us what the extra cost of that horrendous delay will be? Well, we will take full responsibility of all the devolved uh, benefits from April 2020, just exactly as we promised. And I say expects around transfer because this is a joint programme with the DWP. I can't deliver the timetable with this without actually doing it jointly with the DWP. So I expect to be able to deliver that majority uh, within by the end of 2023. And I expect to be able to do all of the transfers by the 2024. It is not in my gift to do that. And if the member would like to take this up with the Secretary of State and the UK government to encourage them to, to deliver on our pace and change, then I would appreciate his support in doing that. Bob Doris to be followed by Neil Bibby. Uh, thanks, President Officer. I, I appreciate the time government officials took this week with myself and Jeremy Balfour to talk us through the complexities of the Social Security programme. I'd be struck with the scale of the programme, the new systems required and the IT being built. It was very impressive indeed. But can I ask where you have learned lessons, Cabinet Secretary, from other large-scale public sector projects or Audit Scotland, which is regularly reviewing the programme, because after all, getting this right first time is the best way to deliver for claimants. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Bob Doris is quite right to point to the fact that we need to get this right first time for everyone involved because these are people who are relying on us to ensure that their payments come through. And that is why, as we have said right from the start of this uh, pro project and the previous Cabinet Secretaries, that safe and secure transition is our absolute priority. We are undertaking the largest, most complex programme of change since devolution. We're building a robust and future-proof digital system which delivers a high volume of payments is a very complex task. And we have learnt from other major initiatives in recent times with our focus on reuse before buy, before build. It's an innovation in the public sector, reducing risk and data duplication and providing value for money. And it's in line with Audit Scotland's principle, uh, principles for a digital future. Regularly reviewing our programme structures and processes and adapting as we grow to change is also the right thing to do and good practice for any programme, as highlighted by Audit Scotland in their report last year, as is the incremental approach to the development of social security. Thank you. Question 11, Neil Bibby, followed by John Mason. The Government's Child Poverty Delivery Plan to 2022 specifically says within the first delivery plan that we are absolutely committed to introducing a new income supplement for low-income families. After today's statement with Social Security barely being devolved by that date, does the Cabinet Secretary honestly believe that the public and the estimated 300,000 children who will be living in poverty by then can trust that a single penny of the supplement will be in their pockets by that date when the Government have broken their promise to fully devolve benefits by the end of this parliament? Cabinet Secretary. I say once again, the 15% of benefit payments will be fully devolved in April of next year. And the reason why the income supplement is not mentioned within the statement is the statement today only refers to the benefits that are devolved under the Scotland Act. They're at the stage where we're able to give a timeline, have an undergone planning and delivery 
uh, consideration. We obviously know, members will know, that there is an option of appraisals going forward to examine the potential policy and delivery options for the income supplement based on our two key principles of reaching the greatest number of children in poverty and ensuring a robust and viable delivery route. The commitment contained within the delivery plan is that we will work towards the introduction of the income supplement over the lifetime of this plan, and that's exactly what we intend to do. John Meeson. Hey, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary in her statement mentioned a new culture of dignity, fairness and respect. I wonder if she can say anything about how that will come into place so that we do not see examples, as we saw in the film I, Daniel Blake, where an ordinary member of the staff tried to help uh, somebody claiming benefits and was jumped on by somebody from senior management. Cabinet Secretary. Well, John Mason again raises the very important point that it is not the DWP staff that are to blame for the system, but the UK government that implement the policies, uh, that have the policies that they need to implement. We are determined to do things differently up in Scotland, and that is very much based on the Social Security Charter and what that enshrined. It's a very powerful document because it's been uh, developed not by government, uh, but by those with lived experience of the Social Security system, and it ensures that the Scottish Social Security Act's principles that legally define our approach to Social Security based on dignity, respect and human rights is upheld in every single act, um, interaction that any individual has with our system. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary and members. That concludes our statement on the delivery of devolved benefits. A point